Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Rob Fenstermacher. I'm the president and CEO of Cultural Vistas, and I'm really glad to see so many people who are able to come out tonight. We were a little worried with the weather that that might have an impact, but uh, again, a great turnout. We're really glad that all of you could join us this evening for our discussion on Global Trends 2030, the midterm outlook. Uh, we're holding this event tonight in conjunction with our board meeting, which will be taking place tomorrow. Uh, and we regularly try and do that because it's a wonderful opportunity for our engaged board members to actually have an opportunity to interact and network with all of the various folks that we work with and serve through our program. So we're really glad that you're all here tonight and are looking forward to that networking. As you all probably know at this point, the Global Trends 2030 report is prepared by the National Intelligence Council um, to look at the future, to try and anticipate the various issues and themes that are going to impact global affairs. Our selection of the title this evening, The Midterm Outlook, really has two meanings, which might seem kind of obvious, but the Global Trends Report is done every four years uh, in conjunction with the presidential election cycle. So the report that we'll be discussing tonight was actually introduced two years ago, and we thought it would be an interesting opportunity now two years into that four-year cycle to see what has changed? Um, what, what has happened in the world, and I think we're all aware a lot of interesting things have happened, uh, that may have changed the outlook for 2030 based on what has happened in just two years. Uh, and the second reason is we obviously just had the midterm elections uh, and thought this again was a wonderful opportunity to look at how those midterm elections might also be impacting the global trends that um, were in the report. And the third reason we thought this was really uh, an interesting topic was that we feel the report and the topic really is fitting in the context of what we do as an international exchange organization. Through the programs that we administer, and this year we're gonna be administering programs for over 5,700 individuals from over 125 different countries around the world, we're able to bring people together from around the world to increase understanding and to share best practices so that we can collaboratively deal with the various global trends such as those in the report. And by promoting our mission to enrich minds, advance global skills, build careers, and connect lives through international exchange, we're helping prepare societies to, to deal with these, with these challenges. Tonight, we have many of our participants here, as well as many of our current partners, um, which include a number of different areas. One, we have a lot of colleagues from the United States uh, State Department. Uh, who we work with on a number of our State Department funded programs. We have some of our colleagues from the German Embassy. Uh, we have a delegation of Korean officials from the Education Ministry in Korea who are being led by Mr. Kim Il-soo, Director of the Regional University Development Division, and he's accompanied by his global intern team at the National Institute for International Education. And we're really glad they didn't just come for this event all the way from South Korea, obviously. Um, but we work very closely with them on a program called Korea West, uh, which was created as a bilateral understanding between our two countries to really increase the amount of exchange between our two countries. And we've been fortunate to be a sponsor of this program since 2008, so we're really glad they could join us this evening. We also have a number of professionals here with us this evening uh, who are part of delegations in the International Visitor Leadership Program, which is the premier exchange program of the United States Department of State. Um, and again, very interesting background. We have a group that is here looking at human trafficking issues, a very serious issue, from the Marshall Islands, Nepal, Oman, Pakistan, Papua New Guinea, and Tunisia. Uh, we have another IVLP delegation here tonight from Argentina, uh, a group of entrepreneurs back there who are here. So again, an interesting background. I think we have another uh, colleague who's from Indonesia who was on a tour a few weeks ago and is now spending a little extra time doing some research. He's in the back there. I mentioned the Korea West program. I know we have a number of participants who are here on that program as well. Um, we have a number of alumni from various fellowship programs we do. So I know we have a number of people from the Robert Bosch Foundation Fellowship Program who are proud to be here. Uh, and Chris Kojum is an an alum of that program as well. We have people from the Alpha Fellowship Program and also from the Congress Bundestag Youth Exchange for Young Professionals, another uh, program funded by the United States Department of State. Um, so you can see we really have all areas of the world represented here this evening. We also have two of our board members who came all the way from Japan and Brazil. And we have our intern who's taking pictures who's from Bosnia-Herzegovina. So we're really representing everything. 
For tonight's discussion, we really couldn't have a better guest on this topic. Chris Kojum was the author of the Global Trends Report while he was serving as the chairman of the National Intelligence Council from 2009 until earlier this year. He really has an illustrious career behind him. He's a specialist in U.S. foreign policy. Prior to working for the National Intelligence Council, he served on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. He was a Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau of Intelligence and Research. He served as the Deputy Director of the 9-11 Commission. He also served as the President of the 9-11 Public Discourse Project, which was a follow-on after the Commission. He also served as a Senior Advisor on the Iraq Study Group. So again, an incredible background, and we're looking forward to hearing some of his views this evening. I'm also really happy that to moderate our discussion, we have a friend and colleague of mine, Steve Sokol, who's the President and CEO of the World Affairs Council in Pittsburgh, who luckily happens to be in town because the World Affairs Council is having their annual meeting here in Washington. So we're glad he was able to join us uh, this evening. Again, has a wonderful background in foreign policy, serving for a number of years at the American Council on Germany. I also worked as the deputy director of the Aspen Institute. And in Pittsburgh, he's been doing some wonderful work, which really fits into the topic of this evening as well. Back in 2012, he was integral in organizing a summit <laughs> called the One Young World Summit. Uh, that brought 1,200 delegates, young professionals from over 183 countries to Pittsburgh to basically talk about the issues that we want to look at this evening and figure out solutions to the world's pressing issues. So a really good background. And before I turn it over to Steve, I also realized that they have one thing in common, which is that both of them were in Germany back in 1989. Um, and I'm sure many in the room are aware, uh, on November 9th, this Sunday, is the 25th anniversary of the fall of the wall. And again, I thought it was fitting because we're sitting here talking about trends. And I, I can't speak for the two of them, but most people had no clue that the wall was going to fall in November. And I'm betting that the two of you probably didn't know that either, but maybe you'll correct us on that. But again, I thought that was very fitting. I think we try and attempt to, to foresee the future and predict the future, but sometimes things happen that you just can't imagine are going to come out. So we have about 20 minutes. I'm going to turn it over to Steve. Uh, they'll talk for about 20 minutes, and then we're going to open it up to question and answers. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Rob, thank you for this incredibly generous introduction. I don't know about the rest of you, but I almost wish that Rob had not stopped speaking, because um, I, I worry that as a trusted colleague, but also as a dear friend, that maybe his judgment is a little clouded. And he's set this incredibly high bar at least for me. I mean, I know that Chris can, can you know, get over that bar incredibly easily, but let's hope I can too. Before we dive in, I actually want to give a shout out to Cultural Vistas, because I think you are an incredible resource as an institution, and the people that you've convened together in this room, both as past fellows, scholars, participants in programs, but also the people that you work with on a regular basis, are an incredible attribute and resource. So thank you for the work that you do to build bridges and bring people together. I'm actually going to try during our conversation today to maybe try to, to sort of build the bridge between the work that Cultural Vistas does and the Global Trends Report. And I'd like to begin by saying that we live in a day and age when international is not an option, right? It's not one of those things that you can pick or choose as you're thinking about your career. I don't think there are any careers anymore that don't have an international or a global component to them. I think that you are more competitive if you have global competency skills, if you have global exposure, and you'll be able to succeed and thrive in a global environment. On a daily basis, each of us hears about how the world is getting smaller. And this morning I was talking to somebody who actually said, in a British accent, you can hear how the world is getting smaller every day. And I didn't quite pick up exactly what he was talking about, but he meant on a daily basis the connectivity that's going on, the relationships that exist, the skills that one needs in order to thrive and succeed. And in the US, we often talk about the importance 
of competing globally, but I would say it's also about collaborating globally. And that's a lot of what Cultural Vistas is all about and what, all, what brings all of you together here. So the challenge for us, right, as thought leaders, as community leaders, some of us as educators, business leaders, part of the elite, in a sense, is how do we train the people that I call the successor generation, right, the next generation of leaders, youth, whether it's high school students, middle school students, college kids, young professionals, how do we train them for tomorrow's world? How do we prepare them for things that we can't even anticipate right now, for challenges that we don't know exist? How do we train them for jobs that we can't even imagine at the moment? That's a pretty tough thing to do. So thankfully, there are people like Chris who are getting us to think about the future. Now, I have to admit that even though we overlapped in Berlin, we were both in Berlin in 1989, I did not really become aware of Chris Kojum until the 9-11 Commission report came out. And there was one thing that really stuck with me after reading the 9-11 Commission report. And that is that the reason why the US was taken by surprise is because we lacked imagination. Well, I'd say Chris has made up for that in spades through the work that he's done at the National Intelligence Council with the Global Trends Report. Global Trends 2030 is the, the fifth iteration of the report. And the idea behind Global Trends is really to provide a framework for people to think about the future. And so I guess I'd like to start by asking you, Chris, to share with us what are some of the overarching trends, some of the key trends that are worth mentioning to sort of set the foundation for our conversation today? Well, well thanks, Steve, and thanks for your kind words, and thank you, Rob, as well. Uh, with global trends, uh, as you look forward 15 years, uh, there's, uh, of course, a huge amount of uncertainty. And so the structure of the report really tries to uh, segment that uncertainty. Uh, and so we begin by talking about what we call megatrends. And those are trends that we're really quite confident will be important and will play themselves out in meaningful ways over this uh, period of time. And uh, the first one I'd like to mention is individual empowerment. It's probably most uh, notable with respect to uh, information technology and the role of any individual to um, not only acquire information but act upon it and affect um, world events, uh, Tahrir Square and events uh, in Cairo as a case in point. But individual empowerment really is broader than that. If you look at the trends or, or what has occurred over the last uh, decade or two in terms of uh, the improvement in the human condition, hundreds of millions of people whose incomes have been lifted, who have become part of the middle class, especially in uh, China and East Asia, but also in uh, India, Turkey, Brazil, uh, other emerging countries. So the trend we see here is that in the world of 2030, for the first time in human history, over half of humanity will no longer be living in absolute poverty. And that's a big, big change. And those individuals will be uh, affecting uh, international um, developments. The second trend uh, I'd like to speak to is one that we really can speak to with great certainty, and that is demography. We know exactly how many 18-year-olds there will be in the world of 2030 because in 2012 they were all born. And those trends are pretty profound. The industrial world, uh, or the old uh, G7 or, and G8 world, is getting much older and average ages will be above 45 uh, across most of Europe. Uh, and that's true in Japan, Korea, and Taiwan as well. Uh, the United States, interestingly, will only be slightly older. The median age will rise from 37 to 39. And Britain, as well, will uh, only age uh, somewhat. 
and that's because of diverse immigrant populations and uh, in the United States, higher birth rates. China, interestingly, is younger than the United States today and will be significantly older in the world of 2030. That's because of China's one-child policy and it will have profound implications for China because as the workforce, uh, the entering workforce, first uh, plateaus and then declines, that means that wages will rise. And so China is in a race to um, be more competitive in the global economy because the Vietnams and Bangladeshs and Indonesias of the world are picking up the industries that uh, China once uh, excelled at. And the thought on demography, two thoughts I'd like to leave you with is that 95% of the population growth is outside of the developed world. So there's a lot of humanity to uh, uh, meet and interact with and almost all of it is outside of uh, uh, you know, the longstanding traditional partners uh, of uh, the United States and uh, at least uh, the European world. And also, 60% of uh, humanity will live in cities in the world of 2030. That's up from 50% today. 50%, 60%, well, what's the difference? Well, the difference is about 1.2 billion people. So each year, the equivalent of uh, seven Chicagos or five Londons will need to be created to uh, uh, care, feed, and house, and provide employment for uh, humanity swarming uh, into the cities of the world. Two other trends, one is the diffusion of power. I'll just speak briefly on that. At every level you look, whether it's between the United States and uh, other countries in the world, uh, within countries, uh, as, as uh, power devolves to regions and away from the center, or at the order of international institutions, where international institutions are increasingly unable to uh, treat the problems before us. Power is diffusing. This is a, a, a little bit the bookend argument of the world of individual empowerment. Uh, existing states uh, and hierarchies in the international order are, um, are eroding. And the fourth trend uh, that we're really quite certain about is the importance of energy, food, and water issues. Humanity will need 50% more energy uh, in the world of 2030 than today, and 35 to 40% more food. That's because those with rising incomes want better diets, which will be a bigger draw on water and energy to produce. A struggle may be too big a word, but uh, the ability of the international community to um, uh, cooperate over the use of uh, uh, energy, water, um, uh, both essential to the production of food, will be significantly challenged uh, in the world of 2030. So, in a sense, to come back to um, Steve's framing comments, uh, international knowledge and understanding is so vital and of increasing importance because the four trends I've outlined for you all point to a messier, difficult, more challenging world with some good points, rising incomes, uh, for humanity, um, but uh, many, many, many challenges uh, before uh, countries and peoples. If I could go back to school, I would probably pay more attention in statistics class. <laughs> um, because a lot of what I think, where, where I think the roots are of the work that you've done here is in the demographic patterns. And it's based on those demographic patterns that you can then tell where there is going to be a shortage of energy and food and water and how these things are going to play out a little bit. But in Global Trends 2030 and in the previous studies that you've done, you also identified some game changers, mm -hmm. you know, some things that can happen that might not necessarily fit in that trend, in that mold once one's on that path. Can you talk a little bit about some of those game changers and how they can, can upset or affect what you've described already? Sure, and, and they really are um, open-ended questions. Uh, game changers mean simply that um, uh, they're imponderables that could go in ways favorable uh, or less so. Uh, the first one I would mention is really uh, institutions of global governance uh, across the board. And here, not just the United Nations, but 
um, regional organizations, professional associations, a any organization that brings international governments uh, or industry or professionals together. They're all enormously challenged. And can we find ways to um, uh, cooperate and collaborate? That's uh, a great question before us. Perhaps even more profound is the question of conflict. Um, in the international order we have today, um, it, it has been a messy one, but since 1945, at any rate, there has been peace among the great powers. Uh, will that uh, endure? Uh, historically, uh, of course, the example of rising powers uh, has been uh, to uh, upset the international order and leading to a systemic war and change. Uh, the world simply can't afford that <laughs> anymore, uh, given uh, the lethality of uh, weaponry. Um, available uh, to all of the great powers. When the Chinese leadership talks about a, a new kind of, of great power relations, um, uh, the United States too, and every member of the international community, wants to find and build a new kind of uh, great power relations. Uh, that's pretty essential. The third game changer uh, really touches upon the questions of food, water, and energy, and that's really uh, technology. Uh, this Global Trends Report really treats in great detail uh, many uh, emerging technologies. I won't speak about them at length. Uh, simply things uh, like IT, which everyone knows, but advanced manufacturing um, and 3D printing, uh, robotics, uh, bioinformatics, um, all areas of human endeavor that are changing very, very rapidly. And the question before us really is can technology help meet the questions of food, water, and energy, and uh, economic expectations uh, that all governments are challenged to meet. At the end of Global Trends 2030, um, you basically map out four alternative worlds, and that's actually the subtitle of Global Trends 2030, Alternative Worlds. And there are four scenarios. Can you maybe share with us some insights on what the best case scenario looks like and what the worst case scenario looks like? Sure. Because, and let me just say this as, as something for, for all of you to think about as well, as I read through those, reread through those scenarios, it seemed to me that no matter how it goes, whether it's best case or worst case, there's a strong case for global competency in order to be able to navigate those worlds that are described there at the end of the study. No, I, I think your observation is exactly right, that global competency um, will um, have an important say in whether the uh, more positive scenario takes place and the lack of global competency will figure greatly in uh, the worst alternative. And let me be specific here. Uh, the best alternative we see is what we call a fusion world, and that is one that's really uh, hallmarked by international uh, cooperation and collaboration. It is just simply not possible to achieve um, positive ends for, um, for the international order, for nation states, <laughs> or for the people who live in those nation states if there is not broad and deep and profound uh, international collaboration. Uh, the role of the United States here uh, is, is important, and we do speak to it. And even in a world where uh, the role of the United States is um, uh, significantly uh, diminished compared to other powers in the international system, it is still the uh, convening um, uh, power uh, in that if things are going to be accomplished internationally, the United States has to be central to those efforts and has to be a, an important voice in, in bringing uh, governments and people together, even if uh, the actual voice of the United States in, in uh, shaping that outcome is less than before. So uh, global competency is, is just essential uh, uh, in learning people's cultures, traditions, uh, enthusiasms, prejudices, uh, national interests, the whole wealth of international understanding is, is, is central if we're going to fashion a way to address 
uh, every problem you can think of is, is, uh, or will require a sophisticated global response. Not just food, water, energy, terrorism, narcotics, human trafficking, <laughs> trade, <laughs> uh, uh, international trade agreements and the rules that govern them all will require international collaboration. And, and the, the, the uh, most pessimistic scenario we outline is one called uh, stalled engines. And that is where governments essentially look inward. In part, it's an echo of the world of the 1930s where competitive currency devaluations, trade barriers, and beggar thy neighbor policies and nations looking inward led to a global, re global depression and eventually to the rise of Nazism and the rise of authoritarianism uh, and uh, world war. So the world of stalled engines uh, doesn't say that uh, world war is where we end up, but it points us in a bad direction because governments turn inward. It can be um, spiced up, if you will, by a pandemic that ca causes us to close the borders, reduce trade, uh, something akin to Spanish influenza of 1918, revisiting the international order would uh, uh, hasten um, this world of uh, states and peoples looking inward, seeking to protect themselves, but in such an effort uh, really um, uh, undermining the very great accomplishments of the international order uh, and for humanity uh, since 1945 to the present. So I'm going to ask one maybe two more questions and then turn it over to you and I, I encourage you all to start thinking about questions. This one might be a little bit of a longer question and a longer response, but I think it's a good one. Um, I was telling Rob that I started my day this morning moderating a conversation that was looking back. And it's interesting to be ending the day moderating a conversation looking forward. I had the opportunity to have a discussion with Nicholas Wapshot, who is the international editor of Newsweek, who just wrote a book entitled The Sphinx about Roosevelt, the isolationists, and World War II. And we were talking a little bit about the learning from history. And Wapshot has a knack for looking backward to try to understand what's going on today. Um, as the global economic crisis was unfolding, he wrote a book about Keynes and Hayek and about their debate about intervention or not. Uh, in the economy. And now, in a book that literally just came out days ago, its uh, copyright date is 2015. Still don't know quite how they did that, but um, <laughs> it was warm when I picked it up. Um, <laughs> but he, he's looking, obviously, at a historical narrative with an incredible character, but he's also making the connection to what's going on in the US today. And so your point just now about um, these, these two worlds, and particularly the more isolationist world, mm -hmm. really ties in with the, the question that sort of Rob opened with, of two years after the study was released, probably more like three or four years since some of the research was done on the study, because it's pretty extensive, um, how are some of these things playing out and particularly in light of Tuesday's elections, how do you see US foreign policy addressing some of the, the trends that you've outlined? Uh, it, it's a great question, and um, it's uh, indistinct. I can see important trends in uh, both directions. First, with respect to this election, and, and frankly, almost any uh, election in the United States, it's intensely domestically focused. It rarely does a foreign policy issue uh, figure uh, in the debate. And so we don't have a lot of discussion of any of the topics I raised before you tonight. I don't think we're really discussed in, in uh, any meaningful way or frankly in any way in the campaign before us. Uh, so elections are not um, helpful that way in terms of uh, public education, which after all is, is what um, is a central role of our political leaders. It's not simply to represent or to vote, but 
they have a critical role in, in uh, educating uh, the electorate about um, difficult issues and sophisticated issues before it. The president first and foremost, but not, not only the president. That's true of uh, uh, our leaders uh, and all of our representatives in Congress, um, and I wish they would take on that role more than they do. So that's one uh, n negative trend, uh, certainly. Another trend is uh, uh, that points uh, potentially in a, a much more positive direction is that we have the lame duck session of Congress coming before us here. And almost for certain, there will be a vote on trade promotion authority um, uh, legislation. A lame duck session is a good time to vote on it because you don't have to face the voters, you don't have to face the unions, you, you don't have to face uh, the Tea Party, you don't have to face those who uh, beat on your door that trade uh, promotion authority means bailing out the banks and losing jobs overseas. Clearly, trade agreements lead to a dynamic situation where um, uh, industries grow and industries uh, don't do so well. And it's this friction uh, that comes about through trade that leads to the political downsides. But any president to uh, reach either a Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement or a Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, both really, really, really important trade agreements for the United States and for the international order, the president needs this trade promotion authority because otherwise under the Constitution, unless Congress votes this authority for the president, all trade policy rests with the Congress. And uh, any agreement would be picked to death through the amendment process. Uh, on Capitol Hill. Trade Promotion Authority has brought us every trade um, round uh, of agreement, the Kennedy round, the Tokyo round, the Uruguay round. We're never going to get through the Doha round, but we have <laughs> TTP and TTIP, uh, both of which really are the alternatives to the next um, international round. Uh, and here, the nay votes are more in the president's party than in the uh, leadership of the House and the new leadership of the Senate. So the president can uh, put together a bipartisan coalition of uh, a majority uh, of Republicans and a significant minority of his own party to uh, get this trade authority and give a real impulse to uh, internationalism. There are many more trends, but I think that's plenty to get us started. That's terrific. And I have a whole bunch more questions, but I don't want to monopolize the evening. So let's open the floor. Is there anybody who's willing to break the ice with a first question? All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Park Nicholson, American Institute for Contemporary German Studies, and uh, Bosch alumnus as well. And I wanted to ask Chris about two competing trends you outlined. One was the diffusion of power, and the other one was an interesting concept you don't hear in the domestic debate that much, which is the United States as a convening power. And who do we convene with? Who are the partner countries? Who are the next global players that we really need to be looking out for in the next 15 years? I guess the way I'd answer that question it would be in a roundabout way and start by thinking of Putin's view of the world. And he thinks there are only three powers that matter, Russia, China, and the United States. He, Russia doesn't want any allies. Russia can take care of Russia. China can take care of China. This United States, it says it's a superpower, but it has all these allies. Allies tie you down. They cause trouble. That's how he looks at the world. We look at the world very differently, that the United States, of course, has um, profound alliances uh, to the east, to the west. The most important uh, powers in the international order, except for Russia and China, are allies of the United States. And that's step one of convening. Uh, the United States can bring all of its uh, allies together. Uh, and then uh, the G20, uh, after all, is, um, it is an international body, but uh, the G7 uh, and 8 and 20 idea uh, uh, are, are ones where the, the role of the United States um, uh, was very important in their establishment. Uh, Giscard started the G7 in France, but it was George Schultz who convinced him to, <laughs> to uh, call for a G7 uh, as a historical reference. So, you know, if China calls a meeting, who will come? If Russia calls a meeting, 
Well, you know, Donetsk and it will show up, but, you know. <laughs> Um, in all seriousness, it, it's really at the current time only the United States who can help bring countries together to um, address the uh, multiplicity of, um, of issues we face. I'm Robert Gordon. I'm on the board of Cultural Vistas. And you raise the issue of conflict. Clearly there's no world conflict right now. But the world is seeing a lot of local conflicts and they seem to be expanding. I think they tie in with terrorism. So what do you see for the future and is there an end game? Well, you're absolutely right that we're in a period of growing conflict. There was uh, actually a, a, a significant downturn in international conflict after the end of the Cold War. Uh, but we seem to be in a time and place now where it is rising again. And it's related to um, all the megatrends I've outlined. It's, it's state failure, because states can't provide for their citizenry, and power is moving away from state control. So there are a dozen or 20 states around the world that are states in name only. And of course, as we know, that, that leads to instability and safe haven for um, terrorists. And, um, uh, I'm not sure there's a, uh, an end soon before us. Uh, almost every initiative um, that the United States is engaged in to, um, to address uh, the, the terrorist threat in one way or another involves helping states to govern better, uh, have more capable uh, uh, militaries, uh, less corruption in government, governments that do better by their citizens and thereby can win legitimacy. Those are all hard questions where uh, the United States or the international community at best is a, um, well, is, is a cheerleader and at best can be of some assistance, but all the heavy lifting has to be done by people in these countries themselves. Uh, so that's going to be with us for a long, long time. Hi, uh, my name is Michelle. I work at Cultural Vistas on the International Visitor Leadership Program. Um, Mr. Kojum, uh, you mentioned that the world is becoming a lot more complicated. Do you feel that uh, current leadership, not just in the U.S., but globally, do you think they are prepared or capable of, of uh, contending with the more difficult world? And um, in 2030, do you feel that leadership at that time will be able to um, be able to deal with the more difficult world? And if not, what is missing or how should we be preparing our future leaders? No, it's a great question and, and thank you for it. I guess the first comment I would make is human agency really matters and so choices by national leadership makes a huge difference and you, you, you don't know what the impact of that decision will be sometimes for um, generations. So uh, just a, a case in point in the United States, immigration reform in the 1960s uh, changing quotas for uh, uh, Asian, African, and Latin American uh, immigrants to the United States um, was not an easy decision. Uh, President Johnson at that time supported it, signed that bill into law, but it's completely changed the face of America. Who would have contemplated that you know, 50 years ago? Yeah, decision making is absolutely um, more capable. I, having worked closely with our national leaders, I, I know they have a sophisticated understanding of, uh, of every topic I've raised before you. Um, it's not telling too many stories out of school that a very, very senior advisor to the president on international issues wanted a briefing and took a briefing for 90 minutes on uh, global trends when it was in its first draft. <laughs> Um, and had lots of ideas for us on topics that he believed were important that we cover and subsequently did. So it, it's not a lack of uh, intellectual firepower and interest. It's simply the task of governing in the 24-7 news cycle and the fact that you have to get elected domestically uh, even as you deal with uh, international issues. There's a, a great uh, line on this. I, I think it was the, the Prime Minister of all places, Luxembourg, who after one exhausting European Union meeting after another that couldn't resolve the problems, he said as follows, we all know what we need to do, 
but we don't know how to do it and get reelected. <laughs> and so political leadership is, uh, is a great art, and uh, there is no rule book. Things that may have worked well a year or two ago may not in the next uh, set of issues before you. And um, because in my past job, I worked so closely with the policymakers um, uh, of this government on both sides of the aisle, but especially in the administration, um, you just have a deep appreciation for how difficult it is to uh, juggle this multitude of issues and to uh, respond uh, effectively and constructively uh, given the constraints that they uh, live under and the silly questions they get asked. I have a question, Chris, that sort of piggybacks on that. And, and that is, how does one reconcile the election cycles with the kind of long-term trends that you're talking about? Because it seems as if many of these issues have the potential of continuously being pushed to the back burner because one's afraid of not being reelected. Oh, oh, absolutely. It's always much easier to just kick the can, push off an issue until after the next election or the next next election. Um, and and here, well, two things, and neither answer is very satisfactory. But one is the electorate. The electorate has to care enough to hold public officials accountable for looking to the longer term. Same is true of our news media. Uh, I heard uh, Jeff. Uh, Fager of CBS News last night, and he absolutely berated his colleagues in the industry for focusing on soft news and, you know, which are the better peanut butter cookies and, you know, which chef are we going to have on this week or what outfit did Hillary or Michelle wear. Um, and, um, and he ripped up and down uh, a colleague unnamed of his uh, at a network uh, who said, well, you know, Afghanistan, talking about that, you know, viewers are turned off by that. We, don't, we, just, we just aren't going to cover that. You know, the questions I put before you, they're complex, assuredly, but the, the whole point of a report like Global Trends and, what I've, and the whole point of people in the news business and what I've devoted my life to is you need to talk about really hard, complicated questions in ways that are interesting, engaging, and compelling for the reader. Because in the absence of public interest and engagement, our public officials, they, they may want to look at uh, trends on a longer term basis, but every incentive will be for them not to. Hi, my name is Jennifer Huffman and I'm a CBYX alumni. My question's kind of been touched on a bit already, but I wanted to push a little bit further in that direction and say you made this parallel between this time that we live in and the 1930s. And what is it that we can do to prevent that from happening? How, how do you engage the citizenry? I think a lot of discussion does a great job of framing debates and framing issues, but I always wonder how. What's that concrete step? How do you get the citizenry to be engaged when they live in a world where the economic crisis has hit them just as badly as Greek and German citizens, for example? Yeah. So. Well, the responsibility is not all, you know, I talk about the United States because that's where I live and you live and where we are, but that responsibility is not with uh, this country alone. You've got the Chancellor of the Federal Republic of Germany, and she and, and the government of Germany bear a very significant responsibility for the economic health of uh, the continent, of the European Union. And she, I understand full well, has her own domestic political issues and concerns. But, uh, you know, the European Union is, is on the brink here of teetering into deflation and recession. And that's got 1930s written all over it. And, you, you know, a lot of people need to step up to the plate and exercise leadership here. How do we get people engaged? Well, you know, that's just the wonderful thing about this country. <laughs> You know, anyone, literally anyone can show up on the doorstep of a member of Congress. And if you're a constituent or live in that state, they're going to pay attention to you. They have to. And if you come organized as a group, our political process is so open and so messy, but it's so open. And so <laughs> if you have the time and the money and the energy, you can make a difference. 
again, I, I worked on the 9-11 Commission. The widows and survivors of people who died in 9-11 uh, pushed, the families of 9-11 pushed for the creation of a commission. The commission that I worked on would not have concluded its work, uh, much less successfully, without the enormous energy and dedication of the families uh, behind that project and led, leading to profound changes in law and practice by the government of the United States that have made this country much, much safer than it was on 9-11 and uh, make it um, uh, fairly remote that uh, uh, a plot of the uh, sophistication that uh, hit this country on September 11th will happen again. That doesn't mean terrorism is over, but uh, this country is much safer. And, you know, these are a bunch of housewives and people who had never been interested in public life until something affected them profoundly on that day that engaged them to political action. Whatever issue you care about passionately, you can engage and you can and will make a difference because the one thing about this political system, <laughs> with all of its faults that I've outlined for you tonight, is it is responsive. It will respond to <laughs> the voice of of people who, uh, uh, you know, harangue their uh, elected representatives. So I think we have time for one more question. And one of the things that I noticed is that I think we've only had Americans speaking so far this evening. <laughs> and I know there are a bunch of people in the room who are not American. So if you're not American and you have a question, way in the back. Hi, uh, my name is Eibol. I'm an intern from France. Um, you were just talking about the EU, and just a very simple question. Do you think we have a future uh, union of uh, states? The European Union absolutely has a future, it, it, and it has come so far. I mean, the achievements from the time of, of Robert Schumann and Jean Monnet uh, to the present are just phenomenal. A continent at peace that's prosperous, certainly by the standards that preceded it, uh, and that embraces you know, virtually the whole continent. So, you know, so much has been achieved. That means so much is at stake in the decisions before us now. And, uh, you know, there are going to be really hard decisions about not simply monetary policy, but about fiscal union, shared uh, budgets um, uh, supported by bond issuance <laughs> across the continent uh, with... Uh, Germany playing a very important role here. You know, those are really big decisions, but I think they're important to the health of the continent, the health of the transatlantic relationship, and to world peace. Speaking as an American, the United States partners, needs partners around the world that export security, export public goods uh, to um, the international system. Europe has been a very important exporter of uh, public goods contributing to security and prosperity around the world. It would be um, pretty uh, catastrophic for um, the international system if uh, Europe became a net importer of both. So Chris, I'd, I'd like to use my prerogative as the, the moderator to ask a, a final question and, and hopefully to come full circle from our starting point and from Rob's introduction and come to something that that I think a lot about in my work at the World Affairs Council, um, which is what are the skills that are necessary to navigate some of the unknowns that you've described to us this evening? Oh my. Um. <laughs> There's no right answer to this question, yeah. of course, right? Well, some of the skills, first of all, above, uh, above all, two skills come to mind. One is respect, uh, a profound respect for other ideas, other countries, other cultures, other ways of life. And that's why international exchange is so important, because you never learn more about your country of origin. I certainly learned the most I ever did about the United States when I lived outside of it for a year and looked at the practices of these funny Americans. Um, so respect uh, and an open mind uh, has to go with that so that you're really open to uh, new thoughts and ideas because best ideas uh, can come from anywhere. 
uh, and it's really, to be successful, it's uh, adapting uh, good ideas to your own uh, country and culture. And, and the third skill set is really uh, studying of uh, languages and cultures. You can claim that you understand a country and culture, but unless you're uh, infused in, in the study of the language, um, a lot of things just don't become clear to you. Once you live the language uh, and, and talk to people in their own language, you learn uh, so much more. And, and that's a particular uh, problem for uh, English speakers in the United States because it leads us to be uh, to be a little lazy or sometimes very lazy. Thank you and, and, and thank you for indulging me with that last question because I know it's a tough one and, and literally it is one that keeps me awake at night and, and it might interest you to hear some of the things that I think about because I do think that they dovetail with what you're talking about. When I look at the kinds of challenges that Chris has described to us this evening, I think about the fact that you need experts, but also people who are inter interdisciplinary in their Absolutely. approach. You need interdisciplinary teams. You don't just need a group of engineers to solve this little bit. You need a group of engineers who can work in Absolutely. a different culture. Um, I think about the fact that you need to have problem solving skills, which ties in with your critical thinking point and the open mind. Because if you're not able to solve problems, if you're not able to think critically, you're not going to come anywhere close to dealing with this myriad of challenges. But I also think, and this ties in um, with, with respect, the word I circle back to often is tolerance, mm -hmm. right? It's mutual respect, but also tolerance and appreciation for things that are different. And the discovery for me, the aha moment for me in the work that I've been doing in Pittsburgh has been at the core of all of this is empathy. And I don't know how to teach empathy. But I do know that programs like the programs that Cultural Vistas offers, where one has the kind of immersive experience where one is learning by doing One's taking some really important steps to developing that empathy. And I actually think that that makes it easier for you to be able to negotiate tough deals, mm -hmm. but it also makes it easier for you to develop solutions to complex problems. I have one more little tidbit about Chris Kojum that you probably didn't know. He mentioned the fact that, of course, he's briefed senior officials in government around the world. But the kind of work that he does is not work that's really just limited to the political elite. I think as we've heard this evening, it's the kind of work that affects us all, right, as global citizens, even if that's a term that some people don't like. But it's also people who are important figures in arts and culture. It's not just the political decision makers. And so he actually got a whole bunch of cred with his kids because he briefed Bono Fun. on the Fun. study. So Chris, thank you for briefing us this evening. And thank you very much. It's really hard to say much more than what we just heard because that was really an incredibly thought-provoking and engaging conversation. And I want to thank you for bringing that to us this evening. But I also want to thank you both for what you do in your daily work. Um, we heard, we talked a little bit about policymakers and the need for leaders to be making these decisions. And I think oftentimes we don't unfortunately see the Chris Kojums of the world that are doing all of this great work behind the scenes that are influencing them and influencing us. And for that, you are really a hidden gem here in the United States and for all of us. And we're very thankful for that. And Steve, the World Affairs Councils, the work that they're doing in local communities around the country to get people to think about these issues is equally critical. Um, the World Affairs Council, together with the Foreign Policy Association, does a program called Great Decisions that brings people together to talk about foreign policy issues. Again, a wonderful thing. If you're not involved in that, you really should, because that's how we can get engaged and help make a difference. I leave this evening very optimistic about the future, what, whatever the option happens to be, because I know we have people in this room 
We have people up here who have been exchange participants, who through those experiences are helping us deal with these issues. And I know we have now younger participants here in the room that are going to be growing and developing their careers so that in 2030, they're going to be the leaders changing the world for all of us. So I thank you both again. Thank you all. I hope you enjoy the evening. We have lots of food and drink. Uh, we will be doing more of these events in the future. As of April, we're going to have a new office down here and hope to do this on a regular basis. In the beginning of February, on February 3rd, we're going to be doing an event around a documentary we're doing for the International Visitor Leadership Program. And I'm hoping many of the people here in the room will join us for that event as well. So thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the evening.